Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another Science and Spirituality Study of the Matsadi.com website. And in the Science and Spirituality Study, what we do is we look at the most recent scientific research and we lay it down alongside of scripture and then we see what we can draw out. You know, what, what the scientific research tends to draw out for us in the scriptures. And it's, it's just a lot, many times it draws out something very unique, you know, very interesting. And this week's study, I titled, New Propulsion System Could Take Humans to Mars Faster Than Ever Before. You know, that, that's neat. And then we look at the spiritual insight. Now, in looking at these, these spacecraft that travel from interplanetary here in our solar system, you know, they, they use plasma. And plasma is the central component of all types of electric space propulsion. And electric currents produce magnetic fields, which are then used to accelerate electrically charged ions and electrons in order to produce thrust. Now, and then we got to note that the thrust is very low, or very small, and it takes a long time to really get up the speed. You know, but um, this in in this uh, in this kind of technology, they use the magnetic fields to accelerate ions and that produces thrust to accelerate out the back. And then in ion thrusters, the plasma, plasma consists of positive ions and equal amounts of electrons. Okay, so it's it's taking these um, gas molecules and they're fragmenting them, right? And then they're sending them out the back of the spacecraft. Now, recently, scientists published a new concept in the, era of pla in the area of plasma ion propulsion systems for space travel. And so this new concept proposes a redesign of the ion pulse engine such that the energetic thrust is generated in the form of what the paper calls plasmoids. Okay. And um, now my pen device. I didn't have my pen device. Oh, I see what happened. Oh, okay, so give me one second. This didn't open up in Adobe Acrobat. Um, here it is, open with Adobe. There you go, now I'll get my pen device. <laughs> okay, so now um, let me just zoom, zoom out a little bit. Oh man, there's something. I should have hit cancel. <laughs> um, let's just, uh, okay. Um, come on, this. Okay. It, it wanted me to make Adobe my default. Somehow it gets always gets switched back to Internet Explorer. Can't stand that. And that's Microsoft for you, you know, always trying to be the center of attention. So, uh, okay, so now, now I got it all, I got it all, um, Straightened out. Okay, so the the idea here on the the redesign of the ion propulsion engine is that the energetic thrust is generated in the form of plasmoids. Uh, let me see here. Do I not have? Why isn't this? Why? Oh, there we go. There's the pen device. Okay. Okay, as plasmoids. Having all kinds of trouble. Okay, so um, and this would decrease the travel time to Mars by they say an order of magnitude, a factor of ten. So it'd be ten times faster. So the paper that was published is right here in the references section, and it is titled "An Alf Alfvenic Reconnecting Plasmoid Thruster," and it was published in the Journal of Plasma Physics, 2020 paper. And so plasmoids are a co. I had looked that up. Right, and to see what, what this is all about. And plasmoids are a coherent structure of plasma and magnetic fields. Plasmoids have been proposed to explain natural phenomenon such as ball lightning and magnetic bubbles in the magnetosphere and objects in cometary tails, comets, you know, cometary tails, and in solar winds and the solar atmosphere and in the heliosphere sheet. Okay, so the, the plasmoid appears in an elongated plasma signal, or sorry, cylinder, 
in the direction of the magnetic field. And plasmoids possess a measurable magnetic moment, a measurable translational speed, and a transverse electrical field, and a measurable size. So there's a lot of things you can do experimentally. And so the physicists first came up with this new idea while hearing about a kind of plasma particle. Um, the kind of plasma particle speeds that were achieved at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory um, National Laboratory in their spherical, or no, in the Plasma Physics, uh, the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, PPPL, and their project was the National Spherical Torus Experiment, okay, and the plasmoids were measured to move at speeds around 20 kilometers per second, which seemed like a significant amount of thrust, and the researcher explained that the thrust behaved like a tokamak. Now, what's a tokamak, right? And so I had looked up with a tokamak. It's a device that uses a powerful magnetic field to confine plasma in the shape of a torus, okay? And um, as in nuclear fusion power systems. So when you look up nuclear fusion, you see that torus shape of the reactor. That is a tokamak. That's learn something new, right? And so the tokamak was originally conceptualized in the 1950s, long time ago, where the first working tokamak was built in 1958. You believe that? And this is attributed to Natan Yavlinsky, a Russian nuclear physicist. Now, the fusion reactor is a popular research topic that has cost billions of dollars in budgets, you know, that designed, that are designed to power next generation power systems right and our next generation nuclear energy technology and now none however have been capable of creating more power than it uses so this technology basically is less than practical you know they're still trying to work out the kinks the concept that is proposed is for a space flight here okay they, they use this kind of this design for um space flight and the fusion engine can be hypothetically remain very lightweight while producing a significant amount of thrust. So this new design is reported to have an alphavenic outflow from the magnetic field reconnection site resulting in the thrust being proportional to the square of the magnetic field strength and does not depend on the mass of the ions of um, species of the plasma. So this results in theoretical velocities of 20 to 500 kilometers per second during the computational simulation. So the researchers, what they did, they didn't build the engine, but they built it, uh, a simulation of the engine, and then they ran those simulations and they, they looked at the results. And that's what, what we see here in the paper, these computer sim simulations that suggest that the design change in the plasma thrust engine is capable of generating thrusts of hundreds of kilometers per second, which is an order of magnitude or, or a factor of 10 times faster than other thrusters, other ion thrusters. And so this means that the new design could move space vehicles faster in, in shorter length of time traveling by a factor of 10. And so listening to new technology addresses a, a major issue of manned space flight, and this is related to cosmic radiation and human DNA damage. The longer humans remain in deep space, it is outside of, that is outside of the Earth's own magnetic field, which shields us from cosmic radiation. Um, the cosmic rays are capable of reaching our DNA, causing damage, mutations, creating disease such as cancer and leukemia, etc. Now, uh, the faster travel would allow for shorter exposure times, and the shorter times will also reduce the psychological or the psycho-emotional toll that comes with having long distance traveling during interplanetary space travel. So, I mean, there are benefits to this, and um, but it was just fascinating research. That was, that was the research. Now, the spiritual insights that we receive from this type of research is related to um, this new thruster technology that may be parallel to our lives, I thought. You know, what I'm thinking of is in relation to the direction and the rate of change our lives take when we encounter the Messiah, right? And we believe in the Lord God, our Father in heaven, and receive the Holy Spirit of God into our lives. Now, this is parallel to the tenfold increase in speed, which simulations prove are possible with this new ion thrust engine design. Now, this change 
of configuration of the ion thrust design parallels what happens when we encounter God, right? In the God in heaven, the God of Israel. When we are born into this world, every man, woman, and child is, are set on the task of searching for the Lord God in heaven who created us. And then this is how we understand what the Torah tells us in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. It says, For if from there you will seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you seek him with all of your heart and all of your soul. Okay. So the Torah speaks of the need to seek God in heaven, right? And I've heard, pe I've had people actually mock this idea before, you know, that this idea of seeking and finding the Lord God in heaven. And they they make a statement. This was years ago. I remember this. They're they saying, what, is God lost? Ha, 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 you know, like that. And I'm not sure what was the motivation behind that mocking attitude. But, uh, and I, I even forget who it was that did that. I kind of do. I don't, I don't know their names anymore. So, but the, this mocking is in regards to what God's word says according to the Torah and elsewhere. You know, that we read right here in Deuteronomy 4, verse 29, and other places like uh, 1 Chronicles 22, verse 19. It says, now set your heart and soul to seek the Lord your God. Okay, the scriptures are telling us to seek God. You to seek the Lord. It ain't a matter of him being lost, right? And even mocking what Yeshua said. You know, when, when they say, what if God lost? You know, this is even mocking what Yeshua said. He said in Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, he says, and Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. So the life that we were born with, the one that walks in the way of the world, when we find the Lord and ask him into our lives, and he helps us to live our lives according to his word. You know, we are then transformed, right? We are transformed. Our desires, our wants, and our loves, our walk, what we do, right? The things that we do, um, our entire lives change. And this is what Paul meant when he said in Romans 6, 4, where he said that we are buried, therefore, with him by baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The idea is if your life has changed is because we are walking in a new life because it's something that God has given us, right? And this is also consistent with what Yeshua said according to Matthew 16, verse 24 to 26. It says, then, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself but whoever loses his lose, or but whoever takes up his cross and follows me, who wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Right? That's a good question. What what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Especially when the God owns everything. Right? We don't own anything. You know, the, um, this, this taking up of the cross is an idiom. And for laying one's life down and dying to the old ways, to the old self. And this is why Paul speaks of losing one's life and finding an entirely new life in Yeshua the Messiah. Um, when we believe in Yeshua, our Father in heaven then gives his spirit into our hearts and our lives. We are transformed. Our dreams are different. Our desires are different. Our thoughts are different. Everything about us should be different. It should be, right? And because the Lord is changing us. And we begin to think about the things of God, right? We're, we're studying scriptures. We should be, right? And those things such as love, mercy, peace, we even talk differently, you know, because of the Lord. And everything in our lives is transformed in him and by him and for him you know, for his glory. You know, this, this is what our lives should look like according to the scriptures. Now, when we find the Lord and the Lord God in heaven finds us, we do not keep our lives as we formerly knew them. That we lose our lives to find an entirely new life in him. And these are the things that the Torah speaks of to the, um, to the gospel message 
as having the presence of God in our in our hearts and in our lives to overcome sin in our lives and to live for the glory of God. And this is what it means that we are more than conquerors according to Romans 8.37. When we can take heart and be greatly encouraged because of the Lord God in whom we trust. The scriptures say, according to Isaiah 14, verse 27, it says, For the Lord of hosts has planned, and can and, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Right? Now, we also read in Proverbs 21, verse 30, it says, There is no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against the Lord. You know, um, these verses speak to us about how that always, that we are always taking courage and to remain strong because the Lord God is ultimately in control. His power is unrivaled and his love endures forever. The Lord God is with us no matter where we go. And this is why and how our lives change when we remain in him and we remain in his word. Now, these things are, are um, these are the things that the scientific research tends to draw out for us in um, when it when speaking about plasmoids magnetic fields new engine design concepts of ion propulsion engines which use plasmoids as a thrust in a much more significant way you know these things remind us of us and what happens to us you know with the power of god when the power of god moves in our lives and you may ask maybe you may be asking yourself you know how can I experience more of God's power in my life? That may be a, may be a question you'd be thinking of. You know, an example that we take is from Abraham. You know, we read in Genesis 15, Abraham, Abram, Abram at that time, his name had not been changed. He found a battle against four. He fought a battle against four kings of the east and rescued his son Lot, his nephew, not his son, his nephew Lot. The Lord God appeared to Abram and said in Genesis 15, verse 1, and he here we read in, in Genesis 15, verse 1, it says, um, the Lord said, okay, so he, the Lord said, uh, do not fear, Altira, and that, that he was Abraham's shield. Okay, so... Um, he speaks of God's exceedingly great riches. And we note a few things here about what the Lord said to Abram. And Abram refused uh, the wealth of Sodom. Okay, And I thought this was a significant thing. When, when we read this story in Genesis 15 regarding Abraham fighting these battles with these four kings, you know, a lot of times, at least I, this is me, you know, I've, I've read through this and I just thought there wasn't much, wasn't much you could get out of this. You know, and, and what, what, what's the significance of these things outside of him rescuing his, his nephew Lot? And when, uh, when we actually take the scientific research and we lay it down alongside Scripture, it's, it's just amazing because these things, this, this come out and um, popped up to me. And in, in a sense that Abraham refused the wealth of Sodom because the Lord had said that he is Abraham's great riches. You know, this is a significant point for experiencing the power of God in our lives okay you know we should not be in the business of longing for this world's rewards and when you think about that you know we are called to seek the riches of God and his wisdom in his ways okay and this is a significant point relating to the power of God in our lives. You know, Lord is telling us in this story, in, in Genesis 15, what Abraham did, just in even in this one verse, that uh, the Lord is telling us how he is the one who will sustain us. You know, that, and these things cause us to ask the question of how much do we love this world? How much do we love this culture? You know, in, in like ungodly television, how much do we love that uh, ungodliness as a means for entertainment for our lives? You think about that for a second, you know, how much do, do we love that? And then you ask the question of why am I not seeing the power of God in my life, right? You know, uh, these things will limit the power of God in our lives. And sometimes we think the battle of Abram had against these four kings was simply a side story. 
and relatively unimportant. You know, and before I had thought that, but now I realize that the, every jot and tittle in Torah is important. You know, we can we can learn and we can grow spiritually from every word and everything in the Torah. And the Lord, the Lord is is teaching us these things, and the the truth of these scriptures is in the Lord God being our shield and our strength our help and our wealth now he is powerful to overcome anything that life can bring our way you know some people look at these stories from the tenach you know the torah the prophets and the writings the, the old testament reading about god in the scripture who delivers israel from slavery in egypt he divided the red sea giving water from the rock bread from heaven and all the meat you could eat right and turning water into wine what yeshua did and raising the dead healing right miracles you know blindness from blindness from sa'arat from from leprosy right and uh from uh being uh lame you know from not being able to walk you know and yet you know so people we, some people may maybe may think or hear about these stories right and yet wonder why they never experience the miraculous power of god in their lives and, and i personally believe the major reason is because of one's love of this world right? and not having entirely given all to the Lord. I, I, I believe that. You know, I believe that. And Yeshua told his disciples that those who believe in him would do greater miracles than these. That they're being told that they would do greater miracles than his rising the dead and healing the blind and multiplying the bread. You know, he would they would do greater miracles than these, you know, and how can this be? You know, and certainly the disciples experienced this. And when Peter, for example, in Acts chapter 2, when he spoke to the people of the temple in Jerusalem, he told 3,000 people. They were standing there listening to him. And they believed and were transformed and they were saved and they were baptized, right? They were they performed a mikvah right there in the pools, right there in Jerusalem, right there surrounding the, the temple. And Yeshua's ministry, we we're told, was limited to Israel. But the disciples reached and reached out and turned the world upside down. And this still happens today as nations and governments are transformed by the power of God through faith in Yeshua the Messiah. And it begins in the individual and in each of us. And however, with that said, most still have no personal experience of the power of God in their lives to overcome sin. And I kind of gave the reasons why I think that that's the case. Now, in order to experience God's transforming power in our lives, we must not discount God's ability to accomplish the impossible, right? You know, God, he did the impossible in the Torah. He can do the impossible in our lives, right? You know, throughout the Torah, we read of God doing the impossible, overcoming demonic forces, defeating armies, dividing water, right? Dividing an entire sea. And giving out water right out of a stone, right? You know, the, the impossible. And even in Genesis 17, we're told that God appeared to Abraham as he was 99 years old and told him that he would have a son and that the numbers of his children would be uncountable like the stars and the sand on the seashore. The, the impossible was that Sarah was beyond childbearing age. And this is an important point that the scriptures are making for us in regards to the impossible. Like, like Abraham, we have to have faith in the, in the possibility of the miraculous, that God can do it, right? And many times we ask ourselves questions in doubt, saying, how can the Lord fix this situation? Or how can God turn this around? Or how can God use someone like me? Okay, and the, the Lord God Almighty, however, he is the the miracle worker right and the lord demonstrates his glory through the impossible and the example that torah gives us is right here in abraham's life and it says when abraham was 99 years old the lord appeared to him and said i am god almighty walk before me blameless i will confirm my covenant between me and you and i will greatly increase your numbers and um we notice here god commands abraham abraham in the same sentence that he states that he will increase his numbers to walk that he is to walk before him blameless okay so this is an interesting thing you know to be blameless is not about being perfect you know perfectly keeping the mitzvot 
right, the commands of God. You know, being blameless, I feel, is related to not walking in the ways of the world, that we are seeking God, that we're looking to Him for our help, always and in everything, right? And being, these things reveal to us that if we want to experience the power of God in our lives, we must, must not walk in sin. And David wrote in Psalm 66, verse 18, he says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And the point is, is that we have to be willing to walk as uh, we have to be willing to walk blamelessly before the Lord, even for the Lord to hear our prayers as David wrote. And remember again, blamelessly is related to our seeking him, remaining in his word, studying his word committing it to memory, right? And living it out and seeking the Lord to help us to do these things. That That is walking blameless before the Lord and not sinning. And James said that there are those who are double-minded in James chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. And this kind of person says that they live by faith but only in word and not in their deeds. So a person trying to live in both worlds for God and for this world will receive nothing from God. James says it, you know, not me, right? There's such a person will not receive anything from God. That's the point that James is making. You know, according to Torah, Abraham needed to walk blameless in order to experience the power of God, right? That so you have Isaac, right? And now the fulfillment of the covenant was accomplished through God's power and based upon God's faithfulness alone. And but Abraham still needed to walk blamelessly before God according to the grace and mercy that God had given him. And this is, ex this is expected of us too. It isn't just an Old Testament thing. I've heard many people say, oh, that's Old Testament. You know, that's not important. We just need New Testament. Now, that's not the case. You know, in order to understand the New Testament and our lives in the Messiah, in Yeshua, we have to understand what's written in the Old Testament. We have to understand what's written in the Torah. And these are the things that the scientific research is drawing out for us today, right? And these things, this idea, this concept that God spoke to Abraham about being blameless, walking before him blameless, this is, this is expected of us as well today. And later on in the Torah, we read how Israel also had to walk blameless before God. And when Israel walked in sin, meaning that she thoughtlessly sinned, not considering what God wanted for their lives, right? You know, that they, they, they were thoughtlessly sinning, they were thoughtlessly committing idolatry, they forsook the Lord, they forsook his word, they forsook his covenant, they forsook his commands. Just just absolutely just walked away from them. that that's the opposite of walking blameless before God. Right? And that that's what it means to not walk blamelessly before God. Not walking blamelessly before God in the history of Israel reveals to us how people missed out on the promised land. Look at the people in the wilderness, right? And they wandered in the wilderness 40 years and they were conquered by their enemies and eventually um, they died, right, in the wilderness. And then we read as this cycle continued throughout the history that eventually uh, Israel was exiled out of the promised land to Babylon. Now, this same principle is true for us today. We think about that. And many people miss the miraculous in their lives due to the failure to walk blamelessly in response to God's grace. Now, God's grace and His presence, His Holy Spirit in our lives enables us to walk blamelessly before Him. Paul said, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not about effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Now, in order to walk, and that was in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, but in order to walk blamelessly before God, this is accomplished by being continually filled with God's Spirit by remaining in His Word, in, in, in His Word daily. Now, this, the Spirit of God in our lives is synonymous to having our lives changed. And this is like, like Abraham having his name changed, we read in Exodus, or sorry, um, in Genesis 17, verses 5 through 7. Yeshua told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And we think about this, another example, to wait in Jerusalem and, until they were endowed with power from above, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And, and this is the giving of the Holy Spirit of God, which is needed in order to accomplish God's will 
according to his word and to have the power of God in our lives. These are the spiritual insights that we receive from the scientific research on this new thruster technology that may be paralleled to our lives. Our direction and our rate of change, our rate changes when we encounter the Messiah and believe in God our Father in heaven and receive his Holy Spirit into our lives. This is how laying the scientific research down alongside of the scriptures uh, draws out these things. You know, it's fantastic. We have a good time doing, you know, studying these things. Now that the change of configuration, the configuration of the ion thruster design parallels the power of God to change our configuration inside, right? So that we become something new on the outside and that we live our lives. He transforms our lives and when we encounter the Almighty God in heaven. So um, that's what I had for the Science and Spirituality study tonight. And if you enjoyed it, give me a thumbs up and come back next week. We'll have more. Okay, thanks for listening. Bye.